this morning on this Lord's Day, nice, bright, and sunny. And it's a blessing today, isn't it? And it's an even bigger blessing. We got Brother Sam Bryan in the crowd. Amen. Good to have you back, brother. All right, class, we're going to pick up basically where we left off last week, and we're talking about boundaries, but also resistance to boundaries. Because, see, we're going to have ourselves challenged by people on the outside as well as yourself on the inside. You will challenge your own boundaries because, see, the, as the Bible teaches, the flesh is weak. And at times, we will find ourselves struggling with things that should be a boundary, but because our weakness of our flesh, we sometimes cross that boundary. And when we cross our boundaries, we got to be careful that it doesn't cause us to be in a state where it's going to be some consequences following it. Amen. So we're on page 274, and we were talking about the guilt messages. Okay, brother, if you can bring my PowerPoint up. We were talking about guilt messages. And see, sometimes people will put guilt on you so that they basically can get you to do what they want or basically control you. And you on your end have to be careful that you don't put yourself in a position that someone is controlling you. And see, that's a sign of weakness when someone else has to dictate to you basically everything you need to do. Almost like, like a child, what to put on, what to wear, when to take a bath when to go to bed, when to get up. But as adults and responsible adults, we, about, we have to be careful that who controls our boundaries? We do. And see, we had talked about uh, the outside resistance, the angry reaction, the guilt messages, and so today we want to finish up with the guilt messages and then go into the consequences and counter moves, the physical resistance, the pain of others, blamers, and real needs, and forgiveness and reconciliation. <clears throat> reconciliation, if we can get to that point. 
Because, see, all of these are all part of our life. One thing about life is, is life easy? Anybody ever had, a, had an easy life so far? No, we, we haven't. None of us have. But it's how we deal with the challenges that come to us dictates basically our faith in God. Because at times, we all going to experience weakness. We all going to experience weariness. We all going to experience, you know, I'm feeling low, I'm feeling down. But we have to learn how to pick ourselves up. And sometimes we may not have that help from someone else. Sometimes we got to learn how to be a self-motivator. So we're on page 274. Now we already talked about those guilt messages, and especially when it's dressed up and God talk. Remember when we talked about that? You know, somebody will make you feel guilty, and one of them they say, and and how can you call yourself a Christian? Now, you know, that's the worst guilt that somebody can put on you. And you call yourself a Christian? And if you're not careful, and Brother David brought up a good point, sometimes we can harbor that guilt within ourselves and say, you know what, I, I, I may not be a Christian if, if, if I don't do that. So sometimes we can put guilt in ourselves and somebody else can just light the fuse and next thing you know, you done gave in to that person. And then the Bible, uh, and another guilt message, you know, doesn't the Bible say honor your parents? And see, that's your parent putting the guilt on the children. And see, that's, one of the things that we're going to talk about, too, you as parents have to let your children live their own lives. You cannot live your life through your children. Amen. And some parents would do that. And so they would do that in such a way that I want you to have everything that I didn't have. Well, if you give them everything that you didn't have, what are they going to be when you're no longer around? They're going to be totally out of sync. There was a situation where the grandmother gave the, the, the grandchildren everything. There was nothing that was lacking. Whenever they got in trouble, guess who was there to rescue them? Grandma. Well, one day grandma passed away, and the children were totally lost. And so then they had to realize Grandma's not around. Now what do I do? But let's pick up on page 274, and we're going to start with people who say these things and these guilt messages that they want to put on you. And Brother McKinley. People who say these things are trying to make you feel guilty about your choices. They are trying to make you feel bad about deciding how you will spend your own time or resources, about growing up, and separating from your parents, or about a, having a life separate from a friend or spiritual leader. Remember the landowner's words in the parable of the workers in the vineyard, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? The Bible says that we are to give and not be self-centered. It does not say that I have to give whatever anyone wants from, from us. We are in control of our giving. We are in control of our giving. That's just like the rich man. You know, why, how you, why should you tell me what to do with my money? And that's how some people are. You know, I used to have this conversation with my children. You know, my money is not your money. Because that's how they feel. Whatever they want, you're going to give it to me. And so you... Remember, you, you're taking them to buy clothes, and especially tennis shoes. And they want the Nikes, the Air Jordan, you know, them $100 and $200 and $300 tennis shoes. And you say, I can't afford that. You got to go over here and get these Kmart or Walmart shoes that's on sale. But guess what happens? When they get on their own and make their own money, are they buying Air Jordans? And no. I said, well, how, come you can't, how come you don't have that? He, oh, I can't afford it. Oh, now it's different. 
But see here, they say these guilt messages to you to make you feel guilty to get what they want. When thinking about life, remember this. No amount of guilt can solve the past, and no amount of anxiety can change the future. And what the Bible says, you can worry all you want. It's not going to change anything because you have no control over it. How many of us wish that, 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 that we can have more hair? You can think and wish it all you want. Your body said, no, it's gone. And as the Bible says, how many of you can say, you know, can you grow taller? No, you are at the height that your genes said this is the height you're going to be. Guilt is not built into our DNA. Who brings guilt onto us? Yourself. You are in control of your own emotions. Let's, let, let's continue. Probably everyone is able to some degree to recognize guilt messages when they hear them. But if you feel bad about your boundaries, maybe you have not looked specifically at the ones your family or other people are using. Here are a few tips about dealing with these external messages. Recognize guilt messages. We have to recognize guilt messages because guilt messages is what the person who's using it against you is basically being a manipulator. Now, if they can control you with guilt messages, they got you. But you got to be able to recognize it to, number one, to put it to a halt. Wait a minute. No. Because remember what we talked about? One of the things that cause a person to be angry with another person is when they hear what word? No. And we all experience that probably ourselves. I got mad one time when I heard a no. What do you mean no? But then I also used a guilt message too. You mean all I've done for you? I'll put that guilt message out there. But that's something I have to work on. So recognize guilt messages. Continue, brother. Recognize guilt messages. Some people swallow guilt messages without seeing how controlling they are. Be open to rebuke and feedback. You need to know when you are being self-centered. But guilt messages are not given for your growth and good. They are given to manipulate and control. That's what it's for, to manipulate and control. That's why we have to recognize it. And see, we we'll get it from our children, we get it from our spouse, we get it from our co-workers, and we even get it from our church members. Recognize it, because see, there's one thing when we recognize it, now it's an opportunity to help that person to also recognize what they're doing. Because if we don't, now we will be enabling them. Let's, let's look at that guilt message is really anger and disguise. Guilt messages are really anger and disguise. The guilt senders are failing to openly admit their anger at you for what you are doing, probably because they would expose how controlling they really are. They would rather focus on you and your behavior than on how they feel. Focusing on their feelings would get them too close to responsibility. You know, that's, that's when a person really trying to put the guilt on you because if, if they find or they discover that really, you know, I'm the problem, and that's what we have to get a person to understand. You have a problem, and the problem is you got an underlying layer of anger and helping the person to deal with that anger. And see, anger is an emotion God gave us. But it's how we use that anger because what did I say earlier? What does anger indicate? Something's wrong, yes. 
Anger is not an indicator that you're mad. Anger indicates that something is wrong. Now, you as a person that that person is directing that anger to, it's an opportunity to talk to see, what are you angry about? That's when counseling comes in. And you don't have to be a certified counselor to talk to someone to help them to bring the reason that they have anger out. Because we all get angry, <clears throat> excuse me, at one time or the other. But it's how we deal with that anger, we can deal it godly and prayerfully, not ungodly. Because one thing about anger that I've has said many times before, careful how we let our anger control us. Because sometimes we can say something out of anger to someone and come back and apologize. But you know you will never have that same relationship with that person again. Some cases you can, and some cases you can't. Because they will always remember that angry statement that you said to them. And they'll come back and say, oh, I forgive you. And then they may not be truthful. Well, I forgot about it. Yeah. Did you really forget about it? But let something happen and watch it to come back up. It'll be regurgitated. No, because I remember what you said to me. Now, see, they really didn't forget. So focusing on their feelings would get them too close to responsibility. Guilt messages hide sadness and hurt. You know, sometimes when a person is guilty, they're hurting and they're sad. And so what they do, it's hidden in the message. Continue, brother. Guilt messages hide sadness and hurt. Instead of expressing and owning these feelings, people try to steer the focus onto you and what you are doing. Recognize that guilt messages are sometimes an expression of a person's sadness, hurt, or need. And see, here it is, again with the boundaries. It's the resistance to boundaries. If you are resistant to your boundary and they are resistant to your boundary and they want to break through your boundary to get you to do what they want you to do for them. Here again, that's the manipulator or the controller. And we're going to see examples of how people control other people, and they don't really have to control you by what they say to you. They can control you by what they do to you or do for you. Let's continue. If guilt works on you, recognize that this is your problem and not others. Realize what the real problem is inside then you will be able to deal with the outside correctly with love and limits. If you continue to blame other people for making you feel guilty, they still have power over you, and you are saying that you will only feel good when they stop doing that. You are giving them control over your life. Stop blaming other people. And see, here, if guilt works on you, recognize this is that this is your problem and not theirs. If a person makes you feel guilty, it's not their problem, now it's yours. Because sometimes we feel guilty because we have a tendency, I hate to say no. Now, I'm gonna use a father-children example. You fathers, you know your daughter don't need what she's coming to ask you for. And you say no. Do you feel guilty when you say no? Yeah, you do. But now, whose guilt problem is that? Is that theirs or yours? It's mine's. It's yours. Because you have to let them understand it's no and letting them understand that the no means I'm helping you to be responsible. That's the key, helping them to be accountable and responsible. 
Let's go to do not explain and justify. Do not explain or justify. Only guilty children do that. This is only playing into their message. You do not owe guilt senders an explanation. Just tell what you have chosen. If you want to tell them why you made a certain decision to help them understand, that is okay. That's okay. If you want to explain it, that's okay. How many of us got to explain to our children every time we tell them no, we got to give them an explanation? I'll give you another example. Leadership in the church don't always have to give a members an explanation. Do they? No. But see, here again, like I said, it's helping us to be responsible and accountable. And it's not to be mean. It's to help accountability and responsibility. Let's look at be assertive and interpret their message as being about their feelings. Being assertive. Brother, hold on one sec. Uh, Brother Davis. Wait a minute, hold it, brother. Get that mic so I can hear you. Can you turn the mic on? What's Brother more? Atkins. Can you One, turn two, Okay, go ahead. Yeah. My, my statement was going to lead right into where you're going. So I hope you don't no, mind. Go ahead, go ahead, brother. Okay. Uh, when it comes to guilt, to me, guilt can be an alert. Mm -hmm. An alert that we need to reevaluate the conversation because as a parent, mm -hmm. I might need to be flexible or I might need to reiterate the position and why we're having a position. So this alerts me for a teaching moment. Excellent. Excellent. And see, interpret it. Be assertive and interpret their message as being about their feelings. And this is a moment of teaching. This is a moment of counseling. This is a moment to help them if they are hurting for healing. So we have to be assertive to interpret their message Let's continue with that, Brother uh, McKinley. Oh, wait a minute, we got to know. Brother Brian, man, it's good to hear your voice. <laughs> Thank you. I had a question. Can you ex elaborate a little bit more on, you say, leadership don't owe an explanation to the church? Mm-hmm. I'll give you a prime example. Why wasn't that brother selected for that ministry? Do I owe you an explanation for that? Because there could be something personal in his life that the church don't need to know because now that's violation of confidentiality. So there are some things the church does not need to know everything, but just trust the leadership that we are looking out for your best interest. Because how would it look if the, you said, well, reading that brother wasn't selected because he goes down to the, to, to the block every weekend, so he don't qualify. What have you just done? Or what has leadership done to that brother? You put his business in the street. You have dest practically destroyed him. The next thing you know, you say, well, how come I don't see brother so-and-so anymore? So that's one reason, even as parent to child, leadership to the church. Even your employer don't have to give all employees an explanation on the decision that they make. But you have to trust leadership, the CEO, the board of directors, that what decision they made is for your best interest also. Okay, let's continue. Let's look at consequences and counter moves.
Let's drop down to consequences and counter moves. And we're on page 276. Yeah, page two, I'm sorry, yeah, two, 276. Consequences and counter moves. Brian was having difficulty with his father, a wealthy man who had always used his money to control other people, even his family. He had taught his children to obey by threatening to cut off his financial support or cut them out of his will. And see, that's another way of controlling, putting down the guilt. Because see, we talked about this before, how parents can control their children and cause their children to have guilt by giving them everything and providing for them everything and then threaten to take it back if they don't do what you want them to do. We read this earlier on page um, uh, 128 with Terry and Sherry. Terry and Sherry had rich father and in-laws, but then when you start resisting your rich relatives and they start to hold back, now they're putting guilt on you and you feeling guilty to the point where if I want to continue with this lifestyle or these perks, I have to be obedient to my parents. And now your parents are manipulators and controllers. Let's continue, bro. As Brian got older, he wanted more freedom from his father, but he found himself addicted to the family money and the pleasures it afforded him. He liked being able to take his wife on vacations to the family summer home. He liked the country club membership and tickets to Big Ten basketball games. But Brian didn't like what his father's control was causing him emotionally and spiritually. He decided to make some changes. He started saying no to some of his father's requests that were disruptive to him and his immediate family. He declined to go on some of the holiday trips when his children wanted to do other things. His father did not like that. Predictably, he started to cut Brian off from the resources that, had, that had, had access to. He used him as an example to the siblings. He began to lavish more privileges on Brian's brothers and sister to show Brian his mistake. Lastly, he changed his will. And see, that is controlling your children. Because, see, when you resist the person who wants to control or manipulate you, there are going to be some consequences behind it. But the thing we have to be prepared for when you, because, see, Brian got to the point where he didn't want his father to continue to control him. And then he mustered up enough strength to say, Dad, look, my children want to go here. And who's first in our life? Wait a minute. Honor thy father and thy mother. Now, see, that's a guilt that they're going to throw on you. Now, wait a minute. You're supposed to honor your father and your mother. Yeah, but, Dad, I got my own family now. Because what did the Bible say about a man should do what? Leave. All right. Come on, class. Very good. Leave and cleave. It says leave and don't drag. Here come mom and dad. <laughs> no, you leave and you cleave. Now that's your family. It's okay for parents to come in to offer advice, but not to come in and take over. Sister Stewart, you had a question? Oh, hold on one sec. Brother Gary, can get Sister Stewart the mic? Um, we also have to be mindful of these words that we say. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to honor? Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean to succumb to. Right. And see, that's where they want to take it out of context. Yeah, out of, yes. 
And often when somebody says to you, you supposed to be a Christian, they themselves are not a Christian. So how can they determine what a Christian looks like? Well, so we need to be careful about that. That's true too. But that's, in your case, that's two Christians talking to each other. Okay. Sister Stancil brought up a point where there was a non-Christian telling her, yes. and you call yourself it's a Christian. See. And see, here again, that's that guilt message yeah. that we got to recognize. Brother Stewart, yeah, uh, can you take your brother, mask down so I can? Yeah, uh, brother, that's just like we were talking about when you said uh, the one person was saying, you know, they owed back rent, and the guy wouldn't accept nothing other than his rent, you know, and they said, well, you know, the, but the person that came to get it wasn't, wasn't the owner of the building, so he said, well, uh, and, you know, you say, you call yourself a Christian, but you talking about putting me and my family out mm -hmm. of our home, right? So how can you call yourself a Christian? So the brother told him, say, well, no, truly, I, I am a Christian, and I wish there was a way I could help you, but the person that owned the building, see, they might not be a Christian. You know what I mean? Okay. So, you know, so sometimes, sometimes we need to understand that, yeah, I, yeah, I'm a Christian, but the people that you owe the money to, might not be. And that's true, too. And also, on that same line, that when people want to use that on, that you're supposed to be a Christian, and I will, hope I don't get in trouble when I say this, sometimes you got to tell them, but aren't you supposed to be a responsible man? Now, see, it goes both ways. Because, yes, I'm a Christian. Yes, especially if it's another Christian. Yes, you are a Christian. Now we got to sit down and go over Galatians 6. Bear ye one another's burdens. That's true. That's what the Bible teaches. But every man should bear his own burden. And that's true, too. So we can help people to a certain extent, but then there are sometimes we got to refer them to someone else. Because one thing that you'll find yourself in a situation, you can get burnt out trying to help everybody. You know, I, I got to admire the preacher that wants to run all over the place trying to help every member, but then his home is neglected. And then that's why you always hear this statement, the worst children are whose children? The preacher's children. <laughs> no, Sister Rupert, now, I'm, I'm just teaching this lesson now. <laughs> but they said the worst children are preacher's children. Why? Because he spends more time. Because as a preacher, preacher his, gets a lot of guilt also. Well, this member's sick. I got to go over it and, 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 and attend to it. Uh, Sister Cook has her hand up, Brother Goodman. Sister Cook. And so he faces a lot. Brother Davis, you out there preaching, you faced a lot of guilt coming to you from your members. But having to help them to understand you got to be responsible. Sister Cook. You brother Good, I understand, and I've heard that a lot of times. PK preachers are just like anybody else's children. They want to put them up because their father is a preacher. They didn't choose their family, but they're just like any other children, and they're going to do things. Mm -hmm. So we need to not label them as bad or worse because of their father's profession. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you. But guess who's in a glass house? Preacher, leadership in a glass house. Let's drop down to page 277. And what are some of the counter moves? Let's deal with that first. First, figure out what that, figure out what it is that you are getting for your lack of boundaries and what you stand to lose by setting boundaries. In Brian's case, it was money. For others, it may be a relationship. Some people are so controlling that if someone starts to stand up to them, they will not relate to them anymore. 
Many people are cut off by the family they grew up in when they, are stop, when they stop playing the family's dysfunctional games. Their parents or their friends will no longer speak to them. So they no longer will speak to you when you stand up to them and no longer give in to them. That's, the, that's your count them. That's the consequences that you will face when you say no to them. I'm not going to do this anymore or be a part or be subject to you controlling me anymore because then you have to have that plan. Well, what do I do when they cut me off? And so you face the risk. You face a risk in setting boundaries and gaining control of your life. In most instances, the results are not drastic. For as soon as the other person finds out that you are serious, they will change. They find the limit setting to be something good for them. As Jesus says, you have won them. The rebuke of a friend turns out to be good medicine. And when Jesus said, you have won them, this is Matthews 18, 15. 18, 15. You go to him, him alone. Can we bring that scripture up, Brother Atkins? Matthews. Matthews 18, 15, and also Proverbs 27, 5. Because you can rebuke a friend, and after you rebuke him, what is he after? After you finish rebuking him. You can rebuke a friend. And after you finish rebuking him, what is he after? Oh, no, somebody said it. He's still your friend. And see, that's a friend that you can rebuke, and after you rebuke him, he's still your friend. Now, if he gets mad and, and leave and, 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 and fuss you out and everything, was he a friend? And we get that with our brothers and sisters, too. Sometimes we have to rebuke our brothers and sisters in the church as well as our siblings. I had to rebuke a sibling of mine. And it took a few years before we started speaking again. Whose problem was that? It was theirs. And I was not going to let it be my problem. What you did, you need to be rebuked. But because they did not hear what they want to hear, to hear again, that guilt message, it was anger underneath all that. If you can't find it, brother, let's go back to the PowerPoint because our time is moving fast and I got a, and I got a cup. Oh, it's up there? Brother McKinney, read that for us. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. That's what Jesus said. You won them. You go to him, a very good brother, alone. Just you and him, or you and her. And you talk it out. And if they forgive you, then you won them. Now your relationship is where it should be. Are we going to be wrong by our brothers and sisters from time to time? Yes. But you go to him or her alone to gain back that relationship. And see, you can find yourself being uh, mature in your Christianity when you can go to someone and explain to them, you know, what you said, you know, that sort of bothered me, that hurt me. And if you talk about it, say, well, I'm sorry, I apologize. You gain your brother and your sister. You gain that relationship. Brother Goodwin, I got a hand up front, Sister Rupert.
Interesting that we're using, uh, we're referring to Matthew 18. Uh, at the national lectureship, the, um, some of the and brothers was explaining to Brother um, Washington and all that if, if we want the brotherhood to get better, mm -hmm. they need to start going to Matthew 18 mm -hmm. instead of um, put them all on blast. Saying, if that young brother is doing something, talk to them. Don't just, um, you know, just don't put it on blast that, you know, we disfellowship and oh, we got an issue with that person. So they was trying to explain to them that's why there's so much animosity going on because they're not going to that scripture and talking to them, mm -hmm. the young mm -hmm. uh, brothers with various issues. Mm -hmm. And see, very good uh, as far as explaining Matthews 18, 15. You go to him or her alone. You don't go to Facebook, Twitter, Twitter, TikTok, or whatever, YouTube, because what you have done, now you have severed that relationship possibly permanently. And then... How can, and, and we'll get to this later on with forgiveness and reconciliation, because God said a few things to us Christians about forgiveness. Sister Stanson. Good morning. Um, I was just thinking, and it may, I may be stating the obvious, but it's not an easy thing to rebuke someone, and you really need to pray about it mm -hmm. because. You want to make sure that you're not being judgmental mm -hmm. or and your tone is right mm -hmm. and just everything with you is in order before mm -hmm. you do that because it's not an easy thing to do. And, and you're right, sister, because it's especially with that relationship that you have, it's you think it's easy for a younger man to rebuke an older man? No. No. You think it's easy for an older man to rebuke a young man? Listen here, this young swipper snapper, you know. I'll tell you a few things. But go to him, listen, old man, let me tell you a few things. No, that's not. Choose your words wisely. And like you said, it is difficult at times. But you pray about it. You ask God for strength and help. But don't go around spreading it all around and say, well, you know, oh, what do you think I should do in this case? No, 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 no. Now you done plant that between you and him and the other people because what you don't want is other people to look at that person a little negatively like because they say, well, you know, Sister Stancil said or have this feeling toward their person. So next thing you know, they now develop a feeling towards that person and what you have done. You have now tainted the relationship between him and the person that you have a problem with or they have a problem with you. It, class, if you can make yourself prepared for Sunday school collections, the brothers are coming forward. Brother Stewart. Uh, brother Good. Can, can, what, can you what, take your mask down so I can hear you? What I have found, Brother Good, is that when I feel as though uh, someone... Hold the mic to your mouth, brother. That someone is, is being disrespectful or someone is just uh, uh, not, you know, trying to get along. Uh, and, you know, uh, what, what I have found for myself is that God... How can I expect, I refer back to that part where, how can I expect God to forgive me? Because Lord knows, don't nobody fall short no more than me. Mm -hmm. So how can I expect God to forgive me if I don't forgive that person mm -hmm. that, you know, might have did something or said something contrary to you or whatever, you know what I mean? And so... It's all right if, if a person, you can't get bent out of shape. That's why it's so important to understand some stuff about life. You, you can't get bent out of shape because a person don't speak to you or something like that, you know what I mean? 
Uh, you have to, you don't know what that person going through. Mm -hmm. So uh, my responsibility is to uh, try my best to control the boldness in my eye, there you my go. anger, and not mm -hmm. overly concern myself about this person that didn't speak or whatever for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So my goal should be controlling my own mess. You know what I mean? Because I, I can't get that person into heaven. The only one I can change or really help is me. Right. And you know, so it helps to understand sometimes when you, you know, you give it to God, like I said, and you, you want forgiveness so you know you, you have to forgive. Right. Because, see, we're going to talk about that later with Matthews 18.35. And, see, that's a, that's a scripture that sometimes we don't really read it to get the meaning out of it. Because if we can't forgive our brothers, God is not going to forgive us. And how many situations, I don't mean scenarios, real-life situations, where a person died without forgiving a person that had transgressed against them. To me, that's, when you think about it, that's in God's hand. But according to God's word, if you can't forgive your brother, how do you expect God to forgive you? And sometimes we have a problem over small, trivial things that we can make it seem like, you know, they stole everything that you own in life. And all it was where they didn't speak to you. Okay, let's continue. Let, let, let's, go back to the, let's go back to the PowerPoint, brother. And let's... Uh, Let's go to physical resistance. Wait until brother bring the PowerPoint, but we're on page 278, and we're going to look at physical resistance. You can start reading, bro. It is sad that we have to include this section, but some people can't maintain their boundaries with another person because they are physically overpowered. Abusive spouses or romantic partners will not take no for an answer. Often women who try to set limits are physically abused. Elder abuse is also too common. And see, physical abuse is when now it comes to the part where there is now harm to the person. And see, you can have an abusive spouse. You can have or an abusive relationship. And also, does abuse in a relationship, is it always physical? No. no. It can be verbal also. Can abuse be nonverbal and nonphysical too? Anybody have an example? What's an abuse that's nonverbal and is nonphysical? Brother Goodwin, my mic runner, Gary. <laughs> Very good, brother. Don't say nothing. I'm abusing you. Brother Ruben, brother Good, how you doing? What did I just do other than ignore him? I just abused him. Another one. You don't pay the bills in the house for your spouse. That's nonverbal, nonphysical, but I'm abusing that relationship. Because especially in a marriage where it says in Ephesians 5, 28 through 33, husbands ought to love their wives as what? 
as Christ loved the church, and also as what? As he loves himself. You think it's something wrong for man when he wakes up in the morning, first thing he do is slaps himself? <laughs> something mentally wrong with him if he does that. But no man does that to his own body. He takes care of his body. And that's the same as the relationship in the home. The man takes care of the wife as his own body, as Christ takes care of the church. And so that's that physical resistance. When the romantic partner will not take no for an answer. Elder abuse. Whoop. Let me. Job abuse and also friend abuse. You know, your job can abuse you too. Put more on you than really what is physically should be put on you. And then because you are job abuse, what are you going to do when you go home? You're going to take it out on your family. And see, I lived in that situation with the, with the job abuse. When my father couldn't handle the job because he was abused on the job, he made a stop on the way home. And it comes in, you know, various containers and so on. And then he would come home and take it out on his family. So that's a double abuse. Job abuse, now family abuse. Someone had their hand up? Yes, sir. Uh, Brother Goodwin. One of the things in handling abuse, especially in the church, and is always of concern, why leadership may not share all details, is because the abuser will do more harm. Yes. Can, I should say, do more harm, and he brings that out. So then safety becomes a concern. Mm -hmm. Then you work from safety to the next. Mm -hmm. to find them safety, then you can begin to deal with, having dealt with that over the years, a brother abusing his wife, and it tend to be in domestic violence that the wife will go back to the abuser. Mm -hmm. And so therefore you have to set. When we had to share it, it had to be established first with her. Right. Then you can share some things going forward. Mm -hmm where you need to go and how you got to handle it. And very good on it because that's one of the areas that we're going to be talking about in our family life ministry. Abuse in a relationship. Because when it comes to physical abuse, when I was on the force and we got a call to a domestic abuse, when we walk in the door, the husband can come in and start giving his explanation and if we see a mark on the wife, that's it. He goes out. Whether he complies or he resists, but he's going out. And see, courts have gotten so hard. It used to be lenient in the day where the wife would go back, as Brother Rupert says, to the abuser. But today, the law has gotten more stricter that they would stop that relationship if possible because of the fact that it has always led up to the point that the abuser goes back and he kills the spouse. Restraint order goes to the court, begs for a restraint order. The court delays on a proven restraint order. The abuser kills the spouse. And so because of the women's movement, and I'll say, 
That's why the courts are very hard when it comes to the accuser, the accused, because now they don't take it lightly like they did in the past. And, uh, and as Brother Rupert had also said, the abuser goes back to the, to the relationship because several things take place. They don't have a way to take care of themselves, so they got to go back home. That's why they used to have the house of roof where they can have the spouse go there until things are settled or, or resolved. Can we go back to my PowerPoint, brother? I got two more minutes. I think I might be able to... Well, we're going to talk a, briefly on the pain of others. When we begin to set boundaries with people we love, a really hard thing happens. They hurt. When we start setting boundaries for those that we love, they hurt. And if we're not careful, we'll let our feelings, emotions, get to the point where, okay, I, I didn't mean to hurt you. Why are you apologizing to them? Were they the ones that have to be held accountable and be responsible? Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> I want the class to hear this. Um, when you was talking about abuse, you probably should have added church abuse too because... I'm getting there. Uh, no, I was just talking about when I noticed all the church, the abuse, mm -hmm. I said, I said, it should be another one up there too, mm -hmm. church abuse. And see, there's church abuse. Because sometimes you'll see it. Sometimes you will be the receiver of it. Because we have to remember, what is the church? It's a hospital. A lot of sick people are coming through that door. And just because they have been baptized for remission of their sins, they're hurting. And because they're hurting, sometimes they feel like they can find some relief by hurting somebody else. We just went over that book, Hurt People Hurt People, because they're hurting. And then because they're hurting, because they're hurting at home. Let's, let's read that first paragraph, Mother McKinley. When we begin to set boundaries with people we love, a really hard thing happens, they hurt. They may feel a hole where you used to plug up their aloneness, their disorganization, or their financial irresponsibility. Whatever it is, they, feel, they will feel a loss. If you love them, this will be difficult for you to watch. But when you are dealing with someone who is hurting, remember that your boundaries are both necessary for you and helpful for them. If you have been enabling them to be irresponsible, your limit setting may nudge them toward responsibility. And that's the pain reason that you set boundaries to help them to move closer to responsibility. We want them to be responsible for their own actions, their own decisions, and so that they can be responsible adults. Because that's one of the main reasons that in the home, you're training your children to be what? To grow up, leave, be responsible adults in society. And it's the same way with the church. The ministries, the teachings, the programs is to help edify and help us to grow and be more knowledgeable as Christians so that we can go out and reproduce. You know, the church isn't designed for this is going to be us until the Lord comes again. No, it's not. 
we're supposed to grow. It's like a flock. You see the shepherd, he's going in among the sheep, making sure everybody's okay, so that the flock can reproduce. That's why I said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Reproduce. We have a question. Over. No, a statement. In reference to abuse, you're always talking about the male abusing the woman. You also have women that abuse the men, and they're oh, yeah. not likely to tell because they are men. Now, I got another police story to tell. <laughs> she just brought that point up. Sometimes women know how to abuse their husband, and he is not the abuser. He just happened to be the recipient of your anger. We have had calls where the wife will call the police on her husband and say, he hit me. But she wouldn't say, because I just got through slapping him, I scratched and keyed up his car. She won't say that, but he hit me. And guess what we'll do? Clink, clink, and out the door he goes like this. And you're right. There are women who will also abuse their spouse. Okay, we're past our time. Let me see if I... Now, let me stop right there, because once I get to talking, that's another 10 or 15 minutes. But class, you've been great this morning, prayerfully. Um, next week, we'll get into the pain of others and real need and reconcile, forgiveness and reconcile. At this time, let us go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time in prayer. We thank you, dear Lord, for the blessings you've given us this day. Dear God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you bless us as a class. We can go over boundaries and resistance to boundaries. We pray, Heavenly Father, that the words and the lesson that was said it would be able to encourage and help us, Lord, as we strive to be better Christians in our lives, to be better equipped to share the good news with our, with our brothers and sisters as well as those that are still have yet to put you on in Christ. We pray, Heavenly Father, you bless this class, bless this congregation, bless our leadership, Lord, and we pray that all things have, that are said and done is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Be with us, Lord, as we bow to the park for our morning worship service. Watch over, protect us, keep us always in your love and in your care. In your Son, Christ Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say, Amen. amen. Sundays at Central make a difference in my life, in your life. Sundays at Central make a difference. In my life, in my life. The Central Church of Christ is a family-oriented congregation that believes that Jesus the Christ is the head of the church and that the Bible is right. We're comprised of a group of committed, imperfect people who are striving to walk with our Lord and Savior. Yes, Sundays at Central make a difference, but we want to ensure that we're impacting your daily lives. We're dedicated to making a difference not only in the lives of our church family, but also in our surrounding communities. Central offers several classes, ministries, and programs for people of all ages that we're confident will fit your needs. We'd love to show you why our congregation is the right church home for you. So stop on by and join us for worship service so that you can experience how Sundays at Central make a difference. Welcome to Central Church of Christ, where Sundays at Central make a difference. She will love you, stop this way.